Okay, I'm starting to get set up here. So uh, as always, if you can please let me know if you can see the live stream. Right now I've just got the title slide up. Uh, so if you can see that and if you can hear my voice, let me know. Okay, hi Marwa. Does that mean you can actually hear me and see the title slide? I'm not sure people can hear me. Again, if somebody could chime in and let me know if you can hear me. Oh, perfect. Okay. Thanks, Marwa. Okay. So, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, I'm going to have a short pause so that I can uh, edit this later. So I'm going to pause for about 10 seconds, and then I'll come back in with the title slide and start the live stream. Okay? So give me about 15 seconds or so. Okay. So welcome all to the 2020 Evolution Exam live stream review. Okay, you should now be able to see me and I hope hear me as well. Okay, so greetings to those of you who are here so far. I see Jaywan, Amog, Kush, Catherine, Lance, Sanme, Alina. Okay, feel free to start chiming in with your questions. I'll give a quick reminder while uh, people are entering their questions. Um, as always, you know, good studying, use all the resources you're given. Uh, almost everything on the exam is either referred to in the review questions uh, or on a previous checkup, right? So really make use of that to make sure that you're addressing all those key points. Nothing on the test should really be a surprise, okay? Or the vocab review. Um, I'm realizing that I didn't post the key because I've been running around crazy today. Oops, sorry, I just dropped a pen on my cat. Um, so I'm going to put a note to post the vocab key. Uh, probably won't be till after this live stream. So if you would like to see that, check it out right after the live stream, okay? Um, otherwise, if practice your VIST. Be ready to write that baby down as soon as you get into class. Or you can wait and do the questions first, uh, but you want to keep that going uh, pretty quickly. So again, I'm ready. Send me your questions. Okay, Catherine, I'd be happy to help you, but I don't have the uh, evolution vocab sheet in front of me, so you're going to need to tell me the specific topic uh, that you're interested in. Um, the skin color and race PowerPoint is posted, Shreya. Uh, it's in the human evolution folder. Uh, it's been posted since last week, so please um, check that out. Um, hey, Allison, uh, the kitty was sitting on my lap, and then I dropped a pen on her head, and she left. So <laughs> she's on the floor right now. Maybe she'll join us later. <laughs> OK. 
Okay, I'm trying to think of anything else to tell you while I'm waiting for questions. Um, yeah, that's really it. Be ready to start right away. Watch the time. Uh, be careful of the terms that can be confused on the matching, right? Different types of selection and that sort of thing. Okay. Here's a different cat. Hey, Pinky. He's not the one that got a pen dropped on his head. Okay, so I see some questions coming in. So Lance is asking uh, about the oxygenation uh, example. So uh, first of all, definitely if you're feeling confused about that, I'd go back and watch the video again and look at your worksheet. You should have some good notes. Uh, but to sort of summarize it off the top of my head, you know, the, the point of that video, the reason we watched it is we're, we're trying to understand more about how these long-term changes on Earth happened. And some of these big long-term changes had to do with the fact that the Earth itself has been changing, the climate has been changing, right? And that's driving these major evolutionary changes. And the one of them that's famous in the history of life on Earth is the sort of transition from a world that was mostly anaerobic, right, to a world that was aerobic. And the reason that transition occurred was because uh, organisms, not plants at first, bacteria, but organisms started to evolve the process of photosynthesis, right, the ability to use carbon dioxide in the air uh, to produce glucose, right, and as a byproduct producing oxygen. So, you know, over a very long period of time, more and more molecules of oxygen being produced by the photosynthesizers going into the air. The photosynthesizers themselves were anaerobic, right? So they're essentially creating this environment that, that when the, the concentration of oxygen became high enough is actually killing them. Um, in the meantime, all that oxygen in the atmosphere and the fact that the photosynthesizers are drawing in the carbon dioxide is actually causing uh, sort of a reverse greenhouse effect, right? Uh, decreasing greenhouse gases and causing the climate to cool. And so you have this combination of this, all this new oxygen in the environment, the climate kind of going a little dramatically crazy, getting much colder, right? That actually ends up wiping out most life on Earth. Uh, fortunately, of course, some things survived, right? And the, as this concentration of oxygen stayed high, there was selection for anaerobic, or anaerobic organisms to basically remain places where there was no oxygen, under the ground, um, you know, certain kinds of places where they wouldn't be exposed to the oxygen, and for the um, aerobic organisms to start doing well, right? So some organisms started to be able to actually take advantage of all that oxygen and do something like cellular respiration where they could get energy out of uh, carbon molecules like glucose way more efficiently. And this, this all took place over a very, very long period of time. Um, but again, the point of it is to see that sequence of events and see how changes in the Earth are causing these major changes in life on Earth. Okay, and there's a little bit of a coevolution there, and that's another use of that term coevolution. There's sort of a coevolution between life and the Earth. As the Earth changes, life changes. And sometimes life changes the Earth, as in the case of photosynthesizers creating all this oxygen. Okay, so now a bunch of questions are coming in, so I'm going to kind of just read through a few things and see where we are. Okay, so a mode, can there be selection for a specific trait and selection against another trait at the same time? Um, okay, um, so a mode, yes, there can definitely be multiple selections going on at the same time. In fact, there always are. If you're a bunny there's a selection about your fur and about how long you live and how long you reproduce and what foods you eat and the predators. There's a gazillion selections going on at the same time for different traits because organisms have lots of traits, right? So that's true in the real world. Now, your question relates more to VIST, and I, and I do want to say up front that I'm not going to tell anybody in this live stream how to write their VIST, right? That's, that's not the point. I need to see that you're able to put that stuff together and write it yourself. That's what I'm testing you on, okay? So I'm not going to tell you things that are specific to the FRQ options, okay? I'll try to come up with a more general concept, and you can decide how to relate it to those um, FRQ options, okay? Uh, but... You know, for the purposes of writing the FRQ, I'm not asking you to describe every possible selection. You're going to kind of narrow it down to the selection that's relevant to that particular prompt, right? That's relevant to, um, you know, the trait that is being described, okay? Um, Priya is asking about the idea of darker to lighter. Um, so, Priya, it's a little more complicated than that in real life because, of course, 
traits can change back and forth over time, right? So we have the sort of idea of humans evolving from organisms that had hair, right? So then as the hair, as there was selection for less hair, you have selection for darker skin. So in the period of time when early humans were living in Africa, there was really only the selection for darker skin. And then as humans started to move around the earth, depending on where they were, there was selection for a sort of optimal skin color. But humans kept moving. So it's certainly possible that population moved to higher latitudes for a while, over many generations, you know, uh, lighter skin, lighter skin. That same population may have moved somewhere else. And then the selection pressure would be different, perhaps lower levels of UVB radiation. And that population could have evolved to be darker again. Right? So, I mean, and in, in I think your question is generally about sort of early humans versus later humans, in which case dark to light. But there are cases where we've seen a population move and actually have um, evolution for towards darker skin again. Uh, so Tanme is asking, do we get to pick the scenario for the FRQ? Yes, it's exactly like the review sheet. Uh, okay, Jay is asking about convergent versus coevolution. So they're really completely different things. They just happen to sound kind of familiar, right? That's why people confuse them. Uh, but they're really very different. So convergent is the word converge means for things to come together. What's coming together are phenotypes. So what we're trying to distinguish, and people were really struggling with this in checkup corrections, we're trying to really distinguish that when we look at two, or two species that seem very similar to us, there's at least two explanations for that. One explanation is that they're similar because they inherited many of their similar traits from a fairly recent common ancestor, right? So as with dogs and wolves, the reason that they're similar is because they inherited the sort of canine characteristics from a common ancestor that was fairly recent. They just diverged recently, okay? Um, convergent evolution is to say that organisms are similar not because they inherited those traits from a recent common ancestor. They actually evolved those traits independently, separately in time and place, okay? Because those particular traits were an advantage in both environments, okay? And sometimes it's because those environments were actually very similar Sometimes the organisms are living in the same environment, like whales and fish, right? Whales and fish did not inherit their streamlined shape from a common ancestor that had a streamlined shape, right? Because whales actually are descended from sort of hippo-like things, okay? So whales did not inherit that from some common ancestor with fish, right? Whales and fish both evolved a streamlined shape separately, independently, in response to the same selection pressure, the water, right? And the physical characteristics of the water, okay? So convergent evolution, independently involving, evolving similar phenotypes uh, in response to similar environments or similar selection pressures. Okay, give me one moment here. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, coevolution. So, coevolution, think of the word cooperate. Co in this case means together, right? Two species evolving in response to one another. Each one is the other's selection pressure. Okay, so positive example insects, the plants that they pollinate, right? Um, the insect is evolving in response to the plant, maybe having a more narrow opening. The insects that are more successful have sort of a longer nose thing, right? Um, in response to that, it is beneficial for plants to have specific pollinators so that the pollen goes to the same kind of plant, okay? So the plants with a shape of flower more specific to that insect, right, they do better. And gradually these two species become very specialized to each other or form some kind of symbiotic uh, mutualistic relationship, okay? It can also be sort of less positive to both parties in the example of predator prey, okay? Some people refer to sort of the sword warfare analogy, right? That, you know, the cheetahs get faster, the only gazelle that, su that survive are the ones that are a little faster. The only cheetah that can get food are the ones that are a little faster. The only gazelle that can survive are the ones that are a little faster right? Or one side develops a weapon, the other side overcomes the weapon. The first side develops a stronger weapon, the other side uh, develops a stronger defense, 
right? Those are all examples of coevolution. Okay, so evolving in response to each other. And I would check out some other examples to help you to understand that. Um, Matthew's asking about the idea of gene shuffling. So the idea there, shuffle, is just to mix up, right? So it means if you have the same two parents, mommy and daddy, right? Remember that they each have 46 chromosomes, right? 23 from their own mother, 23 from their own father. They can't give all those to the baby, right? They can only give half. They could, in any case, give a chromosome one from their mother or a chromosome one from their father. Both parents can do that. So what that means is that they can make lots of kinds of babies. They can make a baby with the chromosome one from mommy's mommy and chromosome two from daddy's daddy or chromosome one from mommy's daddy and chromosome two from daddy's mommy. Okay, and the idea is that a single set of two parents can actually make virtually endless individual offspring that are all different from each other, okay? But all they're doing is mixing up mommies and daddies' genes that they already have. They're not changing human beings. They're just creating unique individual offspring, genetic recombination. Okay. Okay, so we have a question about... Okay, and I see you're starting to answer each other's questions. That's fine. I'll try to catch that. I may not. Um, yeah, if you want to, if you want to retract a message, you can. Okay, so we've got this idea of phenotypic plasticity. Okay, so remember that's the genetic ability to change your phenotype, usually within a certain range, more hair, less hair, more tan, less tan, but the genetic capability to change it a little bit within your lifetime. Okay, it's built in. We can built in be slightly dark, lighter or darker, not infinitely, but slightly. Animals with fur tend to have sort of built-in ability to potentially have the fur be a little thicker, a little thinner, phenotypic plasticity. Some organisms, that makes them a little more flexible, able to survive in slightly different environmental conditions. Well, that evolved in the first place because if organisms are living in places that are naturally fluctuating, right, like in temperate zones, there can be quite a bit of difference between summer and winter. So there was, has for a long time, without humans being involved, been selection for some kind of phenotypic plasticity for organisms and environments that sort of naturally changed a lot, okay? Humans are sort of amplifying this. They're sort of increasing the strength of this selection because we are changing the environment even more. So it's somewhat of an advantage for organisms that are able to kind of, you know, have this wider range um, of phenotypes because maybe humans will shift it a little bit, but they'll still be okay. So to give you another sort of current example, there may be some coral that have some phenotypic plasticity to be able to live in slightly different pH and temperature levels, okay? Maybe other corals are sort of more restricted. They don't have a lot of plasticity. They can kind of only live in a fairly narrow range. Well, chances are those are gonna not survive, right? Because humans are kind of amplifying this variation in the environment, um, this range, of conditions in the environment, which means that we are selecting for coral that already genetically have built in slightly more plasticity and therefore might be able to survive this kind of wider range of conditions that humans are creating. Okay? So make the connection between what the terms mean and actual examples. Uh, Matthew's asking about vestigial traits. Why are shown in embryos? So I'm not quite sure I, I understand the question. Um, we do see vestigial traits in embryos. They just usually don't develop very big, and that's why they're called vestigial. It's a small remnant of, um, of an ancestor for whom that trait got very large during development. So perhaps um, if you had an embryo of both a lizard and a snake, in the lizard, the legs would develop as an embryo and a fetus much larger. In the snake, those wouldn't develop and you would end up with little vestiges, little tiny remnants of legs. Uh, so uh, Adi is asking a question about the rubric that we have to use the phrase, there was a range of trait. Is this phrase graded as a four or five? Um, so in the generic rubric, we don't actually distinguish between a four and a five for variation. Um, I have to look over my rubric still for the FRQ. Um, there may be cases in which I would distinguish between a four and a five, uh, but in any case, proficient is gonna be, do you actually describe some kind of specific variation, right? Um, 
saying there is a range indicates you know there is variation, but it's not really any different than saying, you know, there is variation in tusk length. There is a range of tusk length. Okay, that's kind of saying the same thing, right? So really describing for that trait, what is the variation? Like when we look at the organisms, how are they different from each other? That's what you want to do in B. Uh, Priya, the, the term descent, descent with modification uh, is, it's a little bit of old fashioned language. We don't tend to say that anymore. We tend to say common ancestry. But the implication behind that and what Darwin meant is that the organisms today are a result of descent with modification, meaning they descended from common ancestors and over the generations were modified. It was kind of, again, a little bit of an old fashioned way of saying that. Today, we would just say that organisms share common ancestry, they're evolved from a common ancestor, that sort of thing. Um, but it's, it's the same idea as descent with modification. Okay, uh, Mary Jane's asking about the connection between mass extinction and rapid speciation. So really want to connect that to the idea of niches, right? So in a way, what really tends to lead to rapid speciation is when there are a lot of available niches. Because when you have a lot of available niches in the environment, um, organisms will quickly, there'll be selection for organisms to fill those niches because they won't have any competition in these new niches. Okay, and so they'll sort of rapidly fill them. And that could be true because there was a mass extinction that left a lot of empty niches, or it could be a species that goes to a new environment. Like if there were no birds on the Galapagos and the finches arrived, there's no birds. There's no birds eating the big seeds, no birds eating the small seeds, no birds high in the trees, low in the trees. So you would tend to get this kind of uh, rapid speciation of birds into all those niches where they don't need to compete with each other. Okay, and I'll give you sort of a real world analogy to this. If a whole new field develops like, I don't know, you know, artificial intelligence or, you know, something like this, you suddenly have all these new jobs available. And what you're going to find is suddenly people find ways to fill those jobs, right? They learn new skills and they, they rapidly sort of fill all those things because they're available jobs and people want a job, right? So you get this tendency for people to fill the opportunities that are there or for species to fill these available niches. Um, it, Minjay's asking about the FRQ topic. Um, they're the same as the ones that I gave you on the review sheet, okay? But you're going to use the concepts we study in class. Oh, thanks, Lance. I see you made a comment about the available niches. Thank you. Okay. Um, Kush, yes, the matching is going to be similar to the evolution vocabulary review. Okay, different examples. Uh, for homologous structures, a good description in your book, the sort of quick answer is to think about structures that evolved, I shouldn't say evolved, I'm sorry, developed from the same embryonic structures, okay? So, you know, if we compare a bird and a human, right, the same tissue that develops into a wing and a bird develops into the arms and hands of a human, right? So they're homologous uh, from the same original tissue, but they develop into different structures that are similar and yet different. Okay. Uh, Rhea, I, I said a little bit ago, I'll repeat it in case you didn't hear it. I have been, I just ran straight home and turned on this live stream, so I haven't posted the evolution vocabulary review. I have a note to do that right after this live stream. Okay, so look for that in a little bit. Um, what does folate help with in the human body? Okay, so um, Matthew, it's described in some detail in the article, in the skin color article, uh, but there's two specific things that, and it probably frankly does a lot of things, but the two that are most specific to survival and reproduction is having to do with sperm development and having to do with the development of the neural tube uh, in chordates that becomes the brain and the spinal cord. Okay. Yeah. Thank you guys for answering each other's questions. I can't always, uh, sometimes I get, I see them after I already responded. Okay. Uh, Liana is asking about micro versus macro evolution. Always nice to hear from you, Liana. Um, so, you know, you can think of it as small scale and large scale, micro, macro, small, large, right? For practical purposes, sometimes we're interested in like 
you know, how does the actual act of selection change generation one into generation two, right? Okay, there was selection for these beaks on the island. And we can see in one or two generations that this, the frequency of alleles in generation two is different than the frequency of alleles in generation one. And we're kind of looking in at this small scale to see how selection causes these, starts to cause these changes in the population, okay? That's kind of a very different scale than saying, how did birds evolve, right? Because how did birds evolve? Oh my gosh, now you're talking about millions of years of speciation and changing environments and this much larger scale, right? Convergent evolution, large scale. It took a long time for fishes and whales to evolve these similar traits, right? So now we're talking this huge time scale that has to do with many traits and entire species, right? Just very different than what we're thinking about of how did the frequency of alleles change from this generation to this generation, much, much smaller scale. And we just tend to distinguish between those things to sort of clarify a really big field. Okay, uh, Rohan was asking about variation. So um, you guys already listed some good possibilities. I wanna just clarify that gene flow is kind of this umbrella term, right? Um, and it's just as appropriate to say that gene flow is a source of genetic variation, but you could also specify the causes of gene flow, migration, horizontal gene transfer, interbreeding, right? So just kind of remember that those are, all those terms are sort of correct. Some are just more specific. Ah, Joseph, you're ahead of me. Okay, so Joseph also did a nice description of micro macro. Um, I'm going to read ahead a little bit. We got a couple of descriptions to that. Okay, I'm going to see. I see a question from Caitlin about the founder effect. I'm going to pause for a little bit and see if somebody else answered that before I go into a whole explanation. Okay, so I see that Samuel uh, put in a description of a group of organisms that break off from the population and migrate to another location. Okay, so that's true. That's sort of how the founder effect happens. But what you want to connect that to is like, why do we care about the founder effect, right? Because a, it's a form of genetic drift because the impact of having a group of organisms break off is that the assumption is it's only a very small number, right? So if we want to use the example of, say, the flightless birds, right, it's not like all the cormorants from the mainland went to the Galapagos. It was probably just a few, right? And those few didn't maybe have all the alleles that thousands of birds had on the mainland. So when they go to start this new population in the Galapagos, they're bringing with them a much smaller amount of diversity. And that smaller amount of diversity is what's going to grow into the whole new population facing these new selection pressures, right? But it's a, it's a way smaller amount of diversity compared to like all the birds that were on the mainland. So the significance of the founder effect is it's sort of a genetic bottleneck, right? You're getting a much smaller sample, usually a random sample, of the diversity of this much larger group. And so sometimes we'll see that later on, even if when that founder population has grown into maybe a very large population, it still only has the variation of the original founders and plus maybe new mutations that have occurred uh, since the time that the founding event happened. Okay, I also see that uh, Joseph's uh, talking about emigrating and gene pools. Yes, so not representative is a nice academic way uh, to say that. Joseph has a really good vocabulary. I appreciate that. Okay, so not a good sort of sample. Um, yes, and sometimes what we see with the founder effect is that, you know, the founders happen to have like some unusual trait that ends up becoming very common, right? And I always think of the example of the extra toes on the, on the, the cats in the place in the Florida Keys, Hemingway, Hemingway's cats, okay? Okay, I see somebody kind of distinguishing between interbreeding and inbreeding. Yes, very different. Okay. Okay, I think I got off track. I'm gonna, I need to find where I am. Give me a moment.
Okay, and you guys are totally welcome to share your FRQs. I'm not going to comment on them, but you're welcome to help each other. I appreciate that. Okay, uh, Joseph's piping in about vitamin D. Yeah, and, and the, the difficult thing with vitamin D is we're still trying to figure out exactly all the effects it has. Um, but it appears to have a number of effects on our health. Um, but the reason that bones are particularly important is, one, um, the mothers who are pregnant have to have strong bones uh, because to kind of give birth, and especially in times where we didn't have medical care, to be able to give birth and survive, you needed to have like bones that were pretty strong. Plus some of that vitamin D was going into the fetus and into a young child, right, who maybe was nursing. And if there wasn't enough vitamin D available, the bones wouldn't um, develop properly. And they literally might, might, for example, not be able to walk well, right, because their legs might not develop properly. So um, it, it, it could have made the difference potentially between being able to have success, have children and have successful children. I'm not sure there seems to be some discussion about strong selection. I'm not sure what that is. Um, Chris is asking, what do we need to know about Darwin's life? I don't do it. I mean, I'll be honest, I don't do as much with that as I used to. Um, I think you certainly should be familiar with sort of like the storybook basics, right? About how, you know, he went to the Galapagos Islands to try to understand about, um, you know, how things worked basically in the natural world and by seeing things like fossils and by um, learning at the time about things that people were talking about about populations growing and competition and all this sort of thing that over this sort of long period of time building this hypothesis of natural selection and how that worked and that many decades go by he has lots of evidence right and eventually publishes literally decades later um, this book called uh, On the Origin of Species, which, you know, basically sort of changes the understanding of life uh, forever, right? It helps people to understand how natural selection works. And the story is, of course, more complicated than that, but for purposes of this class, that's about as far um, as we've gone. Okay, do favorable traits make organisms be able to survive and reproduce? Or, okay, I just lost that question in the middle of the answer. Okay, uh, or does it make organism, or does it make organisms survive and reproduce a greater amount of offspring? Okay, first it would be a greater number of offspring. If it's something countable, it's number. Um, do favorable traits make organisms? You know, it could be both. And, and I agree, Marwa, with the idea that in the end, it's the number, and the number could be zero, right? If you don't survive, the number of offspring is zero. Or if you survive, but you don't make any babies, the number of offspring is zero, right? So survival and reproduction are both important, um, but there is kind of the minimal level of surviving and actually making some kind of babies. And then there's the sort of more advanced subtle level that the actual number of babies matter. There's a big difference between passing on your your alleles to one baby and passing on your alleles to 10 babies, right? You're going to increase the frequency of alleles in the next generation faster if you make an actual higher number of babies of offspring, right? So that's where we get into that idea of differential reproduction and that's kind of a little little bit more sophisticated understanding. I see some good descriptions there of interbreeding and inbreeding, so I'll let that one go. Okay, what was the selection pressure? Okay, again, I'm not going to answer ones related to the uh, FRQ questions. So Maya's asking, is interbreeding an example of gene flow genetic variation? Okay, so I want to sort of clarify because you say gene flow slash genetic variation, they're not the same thing, right? So gene flow is a source of genetic variation to a population because the, the meaning of gene flow is genetic information moving from one population to another or species, but you know those have slightly different meanings, okay? So interbreeding actually could happen at two different levels, right? So, so you could have interbreeding between two closely related populations, right? Maybe the northern and the southern organisms have been separated for a while, but they're not quite different species yet, and they have some interbreeding, right, that 
either could combine them both into one gene pool again, or it could just temporarily provide a little bit of new genetic variation. Maybe the northern population had some alleles that the southern population didn't have, and they could sort of contribute that, right? But you could also, so that would make, that would be between populations, but you could also have interbreeding between species if they're closely related enough, like humans and Neanderthals, or I should say modern humans and Neanderthals, um, then they would, again, get new genetic information from species to species. Okay, so that kind of, but it, but it implies either different populations or different species. Okay, so Liana's asking about generalists and specialists. So, um, you know, you've heard these words in, in, in outside of biology, so think about the word specialist. If I'm a specialist doctor, I'm a dermatologist, I only work on people's skin, right? I just do one thing. I specialize in that one thing, right? Soon in physiology, we're going to be talking about, you know, cell special. We've already talked about cell specialization, one function, right? So if a specialist means... Um, that you're specialized, have a very narrow range in the way that you live as an organism. Like you only eat one kind of food or a small number of kinds of food. You can only live in one kind of climate or in one kind of ecosystem, right? Um, so it means sort of that very narrow range of living, okay? And if the world is changing fast, that's not so good, right? Because if your narrow range of living goes away, you might go extinct, right? So because humans are changing things at a fairly rapid rate and getting rid of lots of, of habitats on Earth, uh, we are very much selecting against specialists, okay? Generalists are the opposite. So a specialist would be like a panda bear, right? If we cut down all the bamboo forests, no more panda bears, okay? So a generalist would be that you can live in lots of places, eat lots of things like a rat or a raccoon, okay? And you're going to tend to do better in a changing environment or human disturbance because, you know, so what if we change what we're throwing in the trash? The raccoon's going to eat it anyway, right? So what if we tear down the field that it was living in? It's just going to eat our trash, right? So there's just, it, there's a wider range of, of life conditions and that allows them to be able to sort of tolerate the change that we create, okay? Um, Again, to make sort of a real-world analogy, I mean, that is the real world, but to make a sort of outside-of-biology analogy, um, if I'm a specialist in a particular job, say I work on printing machines for newspapers and newspapers are going away, I might be out of a job. If I'm a generalist and I know how to do lots of different things, then as the economy changes, I might still have a job, right? So th these kinds of concepts are, are not unique to biology. Uh, Marma, Marma was, was asking if inbreeding is genetic drift. No, not directly. Um, both inbreeding and genetic drift, actually not at all, inbreeding and genetic drift are both things that are important in small populations, okay? But inbreeding is not specifically a form of genetic drift. It's just a problem that effect, affects the health of populations um, when they're small. And actually, it doesn't have to be when they're small. It affects the health of any uh, organisms that are doing that consistently. Uh, genetic drift is has a whole separate meaning, right, about random changes in allele frequency. Um, the reason that you're thinking of them together, again, is because they are both connected to small populations. Okay, say so I see some of you uh, piped in on general and specialists, that's great. Okay, uh, Mary Jane's asking about folate. I'm gonna hold off on that for a second till, yeah, and I've actually kind of already. Okay, yeah, connect that to neural tube defects. Okay. Yeah, and skin color stuff, definitely keep going back to the um, worksheet or the PowerPoint. Okay, June gave a nice description of morphology. And just to always remind people, it's not just the way they look, right? Um, morphology includes like the structure of their parts on the inside, right? So, um, you know, it just means all their physical structure.
Uh, Lance is asking for examples of deleterious alleles. I don't know, hemophilia, right? Uh, cystic fibrosis. Um, so it's usually when we use the word deleterious, we usually mean like they're pretty bad, not just not advantageous in that environment, right? So not just the color of the fur. We tend by that description to mean things that would be like bad in any environment, like disorders, okay, is a more common use of that uh, term. Um, Jay is asking what happened to the Neanderthals. Uh, we don't know for sure, right? I mean, there is this is one of these things that uh, evolutionary biologists love to sort of debate because it's hard to tell after the fact exactly what happened, right? So um, there's a lot of hypotheses that are hard to prove. So some people think that the climate was changing in a way that Neanderthal bodies kind of weren't as able to be well adapted for as humans, or maybe their culture wasn't able to adapt to that as well. Um, some people think that humans were directly either competing with them or killing them. We don't really know. Some people think it was a combination. Um, some people think that because the environment was changing fairly rapidly, that Neanderthals were already sort of on their way out by the time they met up with modern humans. They were already kind of shrinking their populations and they were already sort of having trouble coping um, with the new environment. So they probably would have gone away anyway. But again, we're not exactly sure. These are some of the current ideas um, about what happened to them. And it may have been a combination of factors. Um, so I have a couple questions I'm holding off on to see if other people answer them. There's one about taxonomy, one about cultural, biological. Yes, the Neanderthals did go extinct. That's a simple answer to what happened to the Neanderthals. I kind of made a more, a more complex answer. Um, after, of course, they interbred with modern humans. And we have some very important uh, genes that came from the Neanderthals. Okay, some good examples of deleterious alleles. Okay, Rhea's asking about hominins versus hominids. So um, they're different taxonomic groups, right? Part of what's confusing is it's changed in the last 10 or 15 years, okay? Back in the day, like, oh, when your textbook was published, um, we thought that hominid was a group that sort of only included, you know, humans and uh, our sort of human ancestors, and everything else was sort of outside of that. Um, and so we just called that the family hominid. What we understood when we started actually comparing traits and things is that for the nested system to make sense, we had to include the great apes in the hominid family with us, right? Because we share some very important traits. But people still wanted a name and a group for the sort of human things that didn't include the other great apes. So there's actually two different names, and I, there's hominini and hominine. I don't even remember the difference, okay? But um, the idea would be it's a smaller taxonomic group that would be one of those two. I can't remember which. I think, I think it's the general term hominin. It's after chimps, which is the sort of closest other great ape to us, after that group diverged, after that point, we sort of call everything after that human. Artipithecus, Australopithecus, uh, Denisovans, all that stuff. Um, homo, genus, all that is all human. Okay, so some people will refer to that as hominins. Okay, and that gave us a way to distinguish between hominins and hom hominids. <laughs> Um, uh, Jay, again, uh, with your question, Neanderthals, you know, I've read different ideas about this. It, it could be that our culture allowed us to adapt to changing climates more easily. Um, maybe it was differences in technology that we had. I, again, I don't really know. It may have been a combination of culture and biology. That sort of makes sense to me. It was probably more than one thing. Um, but again, I don't know, you know, other than knowing that there's these competing ideas, I, I can't give you any more specific answer than that. Um, a lot of organisms were sort of moving around at that time because the climate was changing a lot. Uh, I mean, if, if, if you're interested, you could certainly research about Neanderthals, uh, but again, you'll probably find some different explanations because it's, it's not, there's not consensus right now about that. Uh, the, the resources would be, if you want to use the course resources, they are the human evolution video, but if you go under the human evolution folder in the locker. I'm pretty sure I have posted some other resources about human evolution that are not things I showed in class. So if you just want a little more background, feel free to check those out. Okay, and thanks. Joseph is putting the official name, Hamin Hamininay. Yeah, 
and there's a tribe and a subfamily. You don't need to know that level of detail. Just the idea that hominids still includes these other organisms like chimpanzees as opposed to hominins, uh, which is more like a smaller group focusing on sort of humans. Okay, I'm going to address this because it's an important question, okay? So, um, Joe is sort of asking about, is it an academic code violation, uh, I think, for you guys to, to share your, your FRQs, okay? So, it's fine for you to compare. The reason I gave it to you in advance is because I want you talking, talking about these topics. I love it when you're having conversations about how should we describe selection, how should we describe time. That means you're thinking about it and learning, okay? That's all good. But ultimately, you're going to sit in that classroom on your, on your own by yourself. You're going to have to write it yourself, right? So it's not an academic code violation to learn from each other, right? Now, if you somehow, you know, tried to cheat and write somebody else's answer on the back of your hand, first of all, it's going to be really hard to fit, right? But if you tried to do something where you literally were not using your own work out of your own head during the time you're taking the test, then yes, that would be an academic code violation. But I gave you the information in advance so you would learn from it. Okay, so take that in the spirit it's intended, learn all you can, but make sure you can write it on your own. Okay, and then you'll be fine. Um, and also, I would also offer that if you do look at other people's FRQs, don't assume they're right, right? <laughs> like somebody could make a mistake and show that to you, and if you just sort of assume, if I'm gonna look at this other person's, it may not be right. So you have to still do your own thinking. Right? If they did it differently than you, why? Which do you think is a better description? Why did you compare to the rubric? Right? Because ultimately you're responsible for evaluating your own and making sure that it's a good description. Okay, so Marwa did a, a good description of ta taxonomy here, so I'm going to let that one go. Uh, Namik. Do we need to know examples? Um, I would say to the extent that we went over in class, we didn't go over every single possible kind of example within the taxonomic groups. But, you know, if we, if we hit something in class, especially more than once, you should probably have an idea of that. But I'm also going to throw some new ones at you. Like if I gave you a cladogram you haven't seen before, or if I gave you some scientific names that you haven't seen before, could you decide those relationships and those taxonomic groups? Okay, but it's nothing really that you haven't seen, especially when I did the... Um, Cladogram practice questions, right? That's the style of questions that you should expect. Uh, Joe, I'm going to answer your question here. Is there a tutorial study session tomorrow? So it's not really a study session for the test because people have already... You know, some people have taken the test and some haven't, so it's not really fair. Um, I have a few people coming in to work with me on things. Um, so if I've told you to do that or you have some reason to do that, um, that that's fine. But that's, that's what that's for. Okay. Um, next Tuesday, by the way, if you usually come in on Tuesdays, uh, it's a weird schedule, but you can still come in for tutorial uh, during the time that's tutorial time. Uh, so Kayla is asking, are cladograms 100% accurate, and can they be a way to organize ideas when trying to group organisms as a hypothesis? Yes. So, uh, no, they're not always 100% accurate. They are sort of the current hypothesis. We're always going to learn new things, or there's going to be things we'll just never know, right? So when somebody makes a cladogram, they're saying, this is what I think happened evolutionarily, right? Sometimes that's overturned later. Sometimes we'll never know. Right? So, but it's, it's a way of putting out, this is what we think happened in the past. And probably sometimes it's more accurate, sometimes it's probably not. But if we discover that we have new evidence and it's not accurate, we're probably going to redraw the cladogram and reclassify the organisms with different names so that we try to match what really happened uh, in the course of evolution. Okay, you guys are having a little discussion about the seeds, so that's cool. 
I think you're talking about the different types of selection. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yes, you're right. Disruptive means the ones in the middle are less likely to survive and reproduce. Okay, good, good, good response, Matthew, about the cladograms. Uh, Liana, you did already ask about binomial nomenclature, or you asked about taxonomy, which Marwa gave a good response to, so I'm going to let that part go. But binomial nomenclature means the combination of the genus, that to say the name of a species like Homo sapiens, you need both the genus word, Homo, and you need the second word, which has a complex name called specific epithet. But the idea is that Homo by itself doesn't tell you that it's modern humans. Sapiens by itself doesn't tell you that it's modern humans. You've got to have both together, binomial two names, Homo sapiens, to say it's this species. It's, and it's kind of confusing because technically Matthew's responding and you're right in general, but te technically the species name is both things, right? So it's both Homo and sapiens together is the species name. Uh, Marwa, regarding the matching, you will have a bank of terms. It's going to be more terms than you actually need, so you'll still have to make some distinctions. <laughs> and, and Joseph gave an answer of why it's not fill in the blank. Yes, I agree. Okay, also, let's see. So, okay, so I'm still, again, I'm going to ignore all your inter interstudent discussion about the FRQs, okay? So you're, I'm, I'm, I don't mind you doing that on this forum. I'm just going to ignore it because it's not, I'm not going to answer those questions, but it's fine for you to communicate with each other. Um, okay, so Leo's asking, would the most recent common ancestor for two species in the cladogram be where the two lineage branches meet? Yes. Um, so the idea, and I'm going to throw in a little more vocabulary, where those two branches meet, like where it was one line and became two, that's also the point of divergence. So where it diverges, connect us to speciation. That's a common ancestor, a recent common ancestor. And we're going to assume that that common ancestor got split into two populations. Those started to go down their different pathways, diverging from each other, right? And eventually evolving into two separate species. So the point of divergence is the common ancestor whether or not we know what that actually was. And that is sort of the initial point of speciation. Okay, Jay is saying, do we need to memorize the layers of the taxonomy pyramid? Um, you know, it, it's, yeah, I would say to the extent, is it helpful to understand like that a phylum is bigger than a class? Yeah, you might run into that. I, I you know, gave you a mnemonic, remember? Dumb kids playing cards on the freeway, catch on the freeway, get smashed. So just use something simple like that and just in case it comes up. You should be comfortable with seeing different taxonomic terms and kind of understanding how they fit into the whole. Uh, so Liana, so endosymbiotic theory, um, that actually came up as well during just cells, right? Like how did we get, it's, it's basically the theory for the evolution of eukaryotic cells, like on Earth. Okay, so this idea that you had prokaryotic cells, right? And um, uh, the leading idea, I think we're pretty confident at this point that it was a, an, uh, an archaea type of prokaryotic cell, took in another cell, uh, and for whatever reason didn't eat it, and that eventually grew into sort of a cell with specialized parts, and that was very successful and that that was sort of the origin of having eukaryotic cells. So it's related to both cells and evolution. It's related to evolution because it's the evolution of that whole group of organisms, that whole domain um, of eukaryotic cells. Yeah, some good descriptions about divergence and, and common ancestors.
Okay, this I think I can answer. Um, so Namika is asking about the fact that humans can tan to a certain degree, which, by the way, what term goes with that? <laughs> Phenotypic plasticity, right? Um, so how does that play a role in terms of selection for a certain skin color? And I think the key there is to realize to a certain degree, right? I mean, tanning is really a pretty small range for most people, right? There's a much larger range of skin color on Earth. So there's going to be, you know, selection for a certain range. And at some parts of the globe, there's going to be selection for your range to be on the darker side. And in other parts of the globe, there's going to be selection for the range to be on the lighter side. Okay? But generally speaking, there's always a range. Um, now, different people genetically have different sort of, whether it's a more narrow range or a broader range, often people with sort of moderate skin tones have sort of more plasticity as well. And plasticity in general, remember, is associated with an environment, tends to evolve in environments that themselves are more changeable, right? So it's not an accident. The In general, we see more phenotypic plasticity in temperate parts of the world, okay? And temperate in this sense means latitude. So remember that sort of in general, it's a little bit of a generalization, but in general, areas near the tropics are more consistent all year round. They tend to get similar amounts of UV radiation, whether it's winter or summer, their climate doesn't change so much between winter and summer, right? Because they're just, they're near the equator. So you don't have a lot of, as much selection for phenotypic plasticity because it's kind of more the same all the time, okay? As you get uh, farther from the equator, you tend to get these bigger swings between, like for example, summer and winter, right? So there starts to be selection for organisms that have a genetic built-in ability to be a little bit flexible. Okay, so we tend to see more phenotypic, phenotypic plasticity and even more generalist to some extent in as you get sort of in these temperate areas. When you get up towards the poles, it, it kind of almost reverses again because the poles are kind of like cold all the time, right? So it's, it's the temperate zones that tend to get the most of that. Okay, uh, Laura's asking about large population with strong selection and long generation time. Would that likely survive or go extinct? Okay, so remember, it's kind of the interplay of the factors. So a large population is going to tend to make it more stable, less likely to go extinct, right? It's kind of hard for them all to die if it's a large population. But strong selection is going to sort of push it to do something, change or go extinct, right? Um, and long generation time. Okay, so say that there was a large population of elephants, right? They have a long generation time. If there was weak selection, no problem, right? Large population, even if the elephants have a long generation time, so they'll evolve slowly, but hey, they've had like millions of years, right? They'll gradually evolve uh, and continue to adapt to the environment with relatively weak selection, okay? Now the problem with strong selection is that there's gonna be a tendency for that to make the population size shrink. So if in the face of strong selection, the organisms are able to maintain a large population, which is more likely if they have a short generation time and make lots of babies, with something like elephants, if you apply strong enough selection, eventually the large population won't be a large population anymore, right? It's gonna get smaller. Um, so if that happens, then now they start to go down that road. It's not instantaneous, but, you know, what we've done to some of these organisms like elephants is that we've reduced their population sizes dramatically by killing them, and we're applying strong selection to what's left of these populations, right? So now with their long generations time, it's, it's just not good, okay? They're, they are likely to go extinct, um, but that's 
because they've gone from a larger population to a smaller population. Uh, but I would say the implication behind your question is that they won't be a large population for long if you keep applying strong selection, right? Um, or they will adapt sufficiently that the selection will be weaker, okay? So if somehow they adapt in such a way that they're well adapted to the, to the new environment, maybe the selection is not so strong anymore. So that's another possibility is that either the strong selection will shrink the population or the organisms will adapt. That's how, you know, how evolution can work, right? So in that case, the, the population may stay large, but they would be different than they were before, right? Okay, some more stuff about convergent evolution, but I went on about at some length about that before, so I'm going to skip that. Yeah, and June has a good response. <laughs> hey, Lance, good to hear from you. <laughs> One of my students from last year piping in. You miss evolution, Lance? Maybe, maybe not. Okay. Folate reserves. Yeah, I, I know some of the language in that skin color article confuses people. The, the word reserve just means that you have sort of like extra stored up. Like sometimes we refer to the oil reserves in our country, right? We have sort of extra oil stored up. So when we say folate reserves, what we mean is that um, we've got sort of a storage, a supply of, of folate, which remember is just a vitamin molecules, okay? And we may have a little more than we need at any given time. Maybe we just ate a bunch of it recently, right? Um, but that if we're exposed to this strong UVB, it literally shines right through our skin and into our blood. I think it's our blood. I'm not actually totally sure of that, but I think it is. And it actually starts breaking down those molecules that are sort of our reserve, right? So that then you might not have enough if you were using it for reproduction or for uh, development of the embryo. And then... <laughs> Feel free to chime in if you remember Revolution Lands. <laughs> yeah, and to clarify, Adi made a point about the folate reserves, um, and so I just want to comment on something you wrote. You said UV radiation does not affect folate production. We don't produce folate, at least I don't think so. We get it from our food, but it's just that when you get it from your food, now you've got these reserves, right? Um, you know, vitamin D is kind of a weird one because most vitamins we don't produce ourselves. We have to get them from food. That's why we call them vitamins. Vitamin D is a very unusual example because we can get it from food, but we do have this sort of, you know, somewhat limited ability to produce it as well. Uh, Liana is asking about biogeography. That's usually in the context of evidence for evolution. So the idea would be, I don't know, I, I like to use the example of cats for that, right? That if we think... I think they evolved, cats evolved in like Africa or something, right? Like or in Egypt or something. So if we see that there are also cats in South America and we know that South America and Africa used to be right next to each other, right? Then that sort of supports this idea that the common ancestor was one thing and that as the continents moved apart, you had some cats evolving in Africa and you had other cats evolving in South America and evolving to be different species of cats, right? So that that actually provides a form of evidence because we can see that those shared a common ancestor in the past when the continents were in a different place, right? So that actually becomes a form of evidence uh, for evolution from a common ancestor. 
Okay, I will go ahead and address uh, Laura's question about the time span for skin color because I didn't really talk about it at the time. Um, and by the way, you can look this up. There's actually a really nice description of the evolution of skin color uh, on Wikipedia of all places. Sometimes they do a nice job there. And it did still take um, thousands of years, right? It's, it's hard for us because, you know, we, we're, not, we're not very good at deciding what's a short and long period of time, right? Um, you know, what we think is a long time is not a long time in evolutionary standards, right? So, you know, compared to the time it took for humans to evolve, like millions of years from when chimpanzees diverged, when we talk about the evolution of certain traits in modern humans, like lactase persistence and um, skin color, differences in skin color, we call those sort of like, you know, recent, relatively recent and all that, but it was still thousands of years, maybe not millions, right? But it was still some thousands of years as humans were migrating all over the globe that this happened. It was still quite a long time by our perspective and certainly many generations, right? So, but, you know, small in the sense of like, it was way after the period of time that modern humans had already evolved our current biology. And there were these relatively minor, lactase persistence, skin color, relatively minor changes that happened after we were already modern humans, right? And that's why those are important examples. Uh, Janth, I talked about differential reproduction a little earlier at more length, but I'll say just basically different numbers of offspring, okay? And you know what I kept, I, I just realized right now what I forgot to refer you guys back to, um, I mean, I guess I probably did, the writing guide. Please go back to that writing guide. It defines a lot of these terms and puts them in context. So, for example, the idea of differential reproduction is explained on your writing guide. So please go back and use all that information. Um, it, it really summarizes a lot of the, the ideas of the unit. Um, Namik is asking, are humans nearing genetic equilibrium? I mean, it's an interesting question. I'm not sure I've ever heard it asked in that way. Um, but I would go back and look at the, the um, qualifications for genetic equilibrium, right? I mean, you'd have to decide there was no selection. I'm not sure I'd say there's no selection. It's different right? You'd have to decide there was no gene flow. Well, I don't know about that. We still have viruses. Um, you know what I mean? Like you'd have to go through those different qualifications, uh, criteria is a better word, the different criteria for genetic equilibrium and say, do those apply now? Some of them apply more or less. I think to say they don't apply at all is not realistic, um, but they certainly may apply in a different way or to a different degree. Um, hi, Shrey. Uh, I think you're not a student of mine, but I'm happy to help you. So you asked about temporal isolation. So uh, first, for my students, that's not a term I really emphasize. I used to go into the different forms of isolation a lot. I've just kind of let go of some of that detail. But the idea is that when we talk about isolation being necessary for speciation, by far, the most common way that happens is geographic isolation. Things simply cannot reproduce together because they aren't in the same place. Okay, so sometimes I just summarize that as reproductive isolation. They cannot reproduce together. But the reality is there are limited times when, or limited circumstances when things can't reproduce together, but they actually are physically still in the same place. And one of the ways that could occur is temporal isolation, right? So the best example of that is with plants. If you have plants that within a population, some of them have genetic differences and start, say, flowering in March, and other ones have slight genetic differences and start flowering in May, even though it's the same species living in the same place, they may no longer be able to pollinate each other, right? Because the flowers are opening and closing at different times. So that would be an example of temporal isolation. There's also behavioral, so you might have birds living in the same place but singing different songs, okay? So, but in terms of speciation, we think that by far, uh, geographic isolation is kind of the most important one. Um, Catherine, your idea of differential reproduction, it's not necessarily having many, it literally is different, differential. It's the idea that organisms that have many babies are actually affecting the frequency of allele in the next generation more than organisms that have fewer babies. So it's not just survival that counts, it's not just reproduction in general that counts, but it's the amount of offspring that you leave that is going to have the impact on the next generation. Okay, and that measurement is what connects back to the term fitness, okay, which people struggle with.
Yeah, Mara, good point. I forgot about the mutations, right? So you can't, of course, humans are still having mutations. Now, again, you kind of have to have a sense of scale. The rate at which our mutations are happening as a species, the rate at which anything's happening is like so slow to us that we can't even hardly make our brains wrap around that. Okay, so, you know, you can think in the long term, are humans going to be different in a thousand years if we make it that long? Um, yeah, we are going to be slightly different biologically, right? 10,000 years, a million years, sure, a little bit, right? But it's so hard to even think about that when our culture is changing so fast. And that's part of that difference between cultural and biological. Uh, Laura, I, I gave a quite a long description earlier about the idea of rapid speciation and mass ex extinction basically has to do with open niches. So I'm going to leave it at that for now. Kush, I want to clarify. Um, you said about differential reproduction that a species has more offspring. No, like an individual organism. Like elephant A had five babies and elephant B got killed by poachers after it only had two babies. So it's not different species, it's different organisms within the same species. Uh, you know, Samuel's asking about common mistakes. I mean, honestly, I've kind of already told you guys about all the commonly missed questions. I mean, really, right? I mean, I told you people are going to have trouble with genetic recombination. Uh, most of the hints that I gave as we were going over the review questions were related to things that people have missed before. So, you know, it's the same things, mixing up variation and selection, not writing according to the rubric right? Confusing convergent evolution and coevolution. It's kind of all the same stuff. And honestly, you know, follow teacher cues. The fact that I keep repeating some of these same things over and over and over, it's because students have trouble with them on the test. So the more I'm emphasizing them, the more it's because students miss them on the test, <laughs> okay? Um, and also, to be honest, I put a lot of them on checkups on purpose. So again, look at those checkup, checkup questions, especially if you miss them. And those might relate to some of the common errors on the exam. Okay. So Mar was asking about why the ability to digest milk would be an advantage. Well, because it's a source of food, right? So it's generally good to have food. Um, how much of an advantage that is depends on what other food is available, right? But, you know, what's nice about being able to use milk is that it's ongoing. Once you have a goat, you got milk until that goat dies, and the goat's hopefully going to have some babies and all more goats, right? So it's a way of having it, – it was. it's very difficult sometimes for hunter-gatherers to have a stable food supply, right? There's times of year where there just isn't that much food around, but maybe there's a little bit of grass, and your goats can eat the grass, and you're still going to have a food supply. So – Having stable food is huge, and that's one of the reasons why, you know, if we want to tie this back to, say, um, some of the stuff around skin color and race, groups that had access to domesticated plants and were able to have agriculture actually purposefully plant wheat and have this big harvest and store it was a huge advantage because you had stable food. Even if there was a drought, even if it was wintertime, you had food. Right? So anything that people could do, like raising animals or doing practicing agriculture, was hugely helpful in providing a stable food supply that you weren't running around all the time trying to find food every single day. Right? Okay, so Jaywan, as far as the types of selection, um, you just need to be able to, by and large, identify examples. Okay, that's the main application. I'm trying to think of it anywhere else on the test. I don't even remember. For sure, there's going to be some vocab, some like uh, representative examples. So just practice with some example that you understand, right? Um, you know, if I have black and gray and white, if 
the black and white can survive, but not the gray. That's disruptive. If the gray does better than the black and white, that's stabilizing. If only the black ones do well or only the white ones, then that would be more like directional. Okay, so just make sure that you could take an example and think about is it the ones in the middle that are surviving and reproducing? Is it the ones on the extremes or the sort of the edges, right? Or is it the ones that are toward one end or another? Okay. Okay, I see some other responses to that, so I'll let that go. Good, thank you for responses to selection. <laughs> thank you, Joseph, for commenting on the birds and the fur. <laughs> that drives me crazy. Okay, please be thoughtful about the words you use on the FRQ and make sure that they are accurate. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that makes me laugh. I wasn't going to say it, but everybody listen to Joseph. Okay. <laughs> no comment. Okay, Liana's asking about the ice fish. Um, I'm going to answer briefly for Liana because I know you watched the ice fish video. I love the ice fish video. I still miss it. I cut it out of my curriculum a couple of years ago just to try to make it shorter, right? But it's really cool if anybody likes this stuff and they want to watch the ice fish video from HHMI. It's just a really neat example. Um, so let me just, now that I babbled on about that, let me just find your question. Uh, sorry, the chat slips back and forth sometimes and I get all, okay. So Liana's asking, how do ice fish pass down the trait for having antifreeze? So the passing down was not really the point of the ice fish example. They pass it down the way they pass down any trait, right? They, it's, it's in a gene, and they, there's a gene that codes for the protein that's this antifreeze, and they pass it down when they reproduce with all their other genes. So that wasn't really the point. Um, the, the, the point of the video was to get you to understand how an entire new gene could evolve right, that you could have a number of things happen. You could have a gene that's no longer in use. So uh, random mutations that are usually selected against would sort of accumulate and the fish could still survive because that it's not depending on that gene anymore. And that gene might eventually have so many changes that it actually codes for a whole different protein with a whole other function, okay? That was more the, the idea behind the ice fish example, okay? Uh, again, Leanna is asking about <clears throat> how have bacteria become resistant to antibiotics? So that actually hasn't come up yet tonight, which is um, kind of surprising. So we'll just kind of do a brief run for that. And by the way, uh, Liana, I don't know if you got one. My students actually have a full rubric that explains that whole thing. That is a hard example. Um, so if you can get your hands on that, that would probably be helpful. Um, but the to give sort of a kind of a thirty second run through here, right? Variation. Random mutations in bacteria, some have more resistance than others. I shouldn't really say more. Some, some don't have any resistance at all to a particular antibiotic. Some have some resistance or stronger resistance to that antibiotic, meaning they might have actually more mutations that contribute to that resistance, and they would have sort of stronger and stronger resistance. Okay, But at any rate, um, whatever they have is genetically based, and because they're bacteria, uh, it's sort of different rules around inheritance, right? Because now, instead of talking about sexual reproduction, you're talking about asexual reproduction, and also the very important possibility of horizontal gene transfer, okay? Uh, for selection, selection pressure, antibiotics, right? That's what's causing the selection to occur. If we weren't using antibiotics, it wouldn't matter if they had resistance or not, okay? Um, and the selection itself, as always, means that some live and some die. So in this case, we are selecting for bacteria with stronger resistance because they don't die from the antibiotic. And the bacteria that survive are able to go on and either asexually reproduce themselves or potentially pass that gene on uh, to another bacteria. 
uh, and then of course over what appears to us to be a very short period of time, but is actually quite a few generations for the bacteria, um, is you know you get a higher frequency of the resistance in the first place, and the ones that are and the bacteria are also being selected have stronger and stronger degrees of resistance. So that, that's a little complicated example, um, but I think I'll leave it at that for now. Okay, I'm just going to comment. I'm, I'm mostly ignoring your conversations about uh, the, the FRQ, but I want to comment on one that Amog said, uh, Amog R. He said, it is sexual reproduction, so based on the gene flow. Okay, so sexual reproduction, once again, is not a form of gene flow. Just want to clarify that. Ah, thank you, Jay. You caught that. Uh, thing that Amog said. Sorry, I'm having to find my place here again. Uh, Adi, for VIST, um, do we have to explain why traits are selected for? Yes. You kind of want to just tell the whole story, right? So if you think about the S section, you're starting with the selection pressure, the thing that's kind of triggering the whole thing to happen, right? And then you're sort of telling the story of the selection because of the selection pressure, some lived, some died for this reason, right? And therefore, the species changed over time, right? So kind of just tell the story from start to finish. So yes, why they're selected for is part of that story. Okay. Jay, when you're talking about having trouble mentioning differential reproduction and you're having trouble writing that, oh, maybe you could refer to the writing guide, right? So you've got some, some references there to help you with your writing, okay? Between the writing guide and the rubric, you guys are given really specific instructions, okay? So make sure you're checking um, those references, okay? Yes, we also put antifreeze in our car, Adrian. It's kind of a, a um, it's kind of an analogy. Yeah. So what we mean when we talk about antifreeze being made, it just means it keeps the liquid from freezing into solid ice, right? It, it, the kind that living organisms make is not the same kind we put in our car, okay? So there's a number of ways to lower the freezing point uh, I think you can just put sugar in a liquid and that will happen, right? But there's a number of things you can do to lower the freezing point, and that's what we mean by antifreeze. Okay. Um, <clears throat> again, uh, Mar was asking about the ice fish. It's an example that I don't use anymore. It's a pretty cool example, but I don't use it. So for my classes, just to simplify matters, you don't need to know it. Okay. Okay, Jay's asking about the dog and the wolf question on the for convergent evolution. Again, I went over the, the difference before, but in short, um, you say, why is it false that that's convergent evolution for dogs and wolves? Don't they share similar traits? So, again, briefly, there are at least two reasons why things can have similar traits, right? One is that they got those traits from a recent common answer, in, case, in which case they're directly related. That trait evolved down here, and they both have it, okay? 
convergent evolution, the, the trait evolved separately in two separate lines that are not directly related, like whales and fish, okay? And therefore, the similarity we see is not due to them getting it from a common ancestor. The similarity that we see is because it evolved separately in two similar environments, okay? So that's the key idea there, is about where did those similar traits come from, okay? So again, you might want to also check the book. It has a nice description of convergent evolution. And by the way, just an aside on that, that's why it can be hard for us to make cladograms sometimes, because it can be hard to tell when things are similar what the reason for that is, and we have to do some more uh, research. Um, so Mar was asking about the antibiotic example. And again, remember that antibiotic resistance is actually a little bit hard to fit into the, the rubric because it's, it, it is kind of a special example because um, most of the other examples aren't bacteria. and It's just a somewhat complicated example. Um, so if you're talking about multiple antibiotic resistant bacteria like MRSA, really bad ones, they have many mutations that made them that strongly resistant, okay? So that's going to take actually quite a lot of generations. Um, but you can have a sort of weak level of resistance, maybe just a single mutation. If you, The really nice description of that was in that video I showed you, right? That remember that some of the bacteria just with one mutation could then survive a little bit of the antibiotic, but to be able to survive 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times, they needed multiple mutations, right? So it, it is an actually progressive trait, okay? You have stronger and weaker resistance. But even a little resistance might make a difference, okay? And that could evolve pretty quickly. But to get to the really nasty bacteria, nasty for us, that require many mutations to be that bad, now you're talking about something that's going to take quite a few generations to have all those random mutations in the same lineage. Okay, um, Maro, I know you've asked a few times about lactose, lactase persistence and convergence. I'm actually not going to answer that question, okay? So um, I want you to kind of think about what that term means and whether that's a reasonable application of that, but I'm not going to answer the question here. We actually did talk about in-class. You should have some class notes about that. Okay, and I see there's kind of a whole discussion. Um, hopefully I clarified a little bit of that polygenic versus single gene for uh, bacteria. It has to do with how strong the resistance is. <laughs> okay, nice use of the term consensus, Leo. <laughs> Perhaps you guys are arriving at consensus. That's awesome. I hope it's correct. <laughs> I'm not going to comment on that because I've been ignoring all those comments. Um, when does this live end? I don't know when I'm tired. I just, oh my gosh, it is getting late, 9.30. Yeah, pretty soon, Liana. Okay, I actually am at the end of the question, so maybe this is a good time, right? Um, so yeah, thank you, Liana. I think it's a good time. So it's been an hour and a half. Uh, we've talked about a lot of stuff, so just keep checking your resources. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead after this live stream and post the vocabulary review key. So if you had any doubts about any of those terms, I would just double check. Um, but try to figure out yourself first. Like copying the terms onto the, the review is not going to help you. So make your best guess and then see if you were um, correct. Okay? Um, other than that, don't wait too long. Get some good sleep. And, um, you know, if you've been tuning in and working on this stuff, you've prepared a lot. So be confident, right? Just do a last little minute focus on the things you feel less secure about. And then go to good night's sleep. And I will see you all tomorrow. Okay? So take care and good night.